Why aren't you doing what we ask while we do all these things you don't want us to do? Welcome back to A Simple Man of God, Daniel, and we're going to continue our series on Malachi. And you may recall from chapter 1, verse 1, Malachi means my messenger. And we discussed in chapter 1 that God loves his covenant people even when they give bad offerings and then blaspheme the name of God by taking his name in vain by saying those offerings are good. When we got into chapter 2 in the last message, we can essentially call that message bovine scatology. We were looking at how a lot of teachers, and they did name names, lead people astray. And God rebuked them and showed that they are actually outside of his covenant people. And that was all for the priests. Now, technically, we're still going to be looking at the priests as we continue in chapter 2. And today we're covering verses 10 through 16. But we also see how this is kind of for everybody. Especially today, those who call themselves Christians. Christians are God's covenant people now. Not to say Israel isn't, isn't important. So all that being said, what do you say we uh, dive in here? Chapter 2 of Malachi, verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Verse 13. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit. And let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Now, we start back in verse 10 there. When he says, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? This is a good reminder to us that there is only one God to be worshipped. One true father of us all. That we are one human race. So shouldn't we treat each other with respect? Not just because we are all, all humans. We are all genetically similar. We look very much the same. Sure, we have different variations in skin color and what our faces and limbs look like, what hair color we have. But most importantly, we were created by God. We all have that in common. We have God's image within us. So we should be showing love and respect and grace and mercy to each other. But we should all be doing it as we worship the one true God, the only God that exists. All others are false gods at best. Other gods are imaginations. At worst, they're demons. And we have good precedence for this. Read the book of Daniel to see what I'm talking about. But we continue because we talk about 
how Judah has been faithless. Israel and Jerusalem have profaned the sanctuary of the Lord. How? They married daughters of a foreign god. Now, first of all, this tells us that when we read in Ezra 9 and 10 and Nehemiah 13, that these guys beat these men who married foreign wives, and they cast these women and many of their children away. Why? Because they refused to turn away from their own gods and worship the one true God. You could even say that this is they were doing what Solomon did. They invited these foreign women in. Solomon, the wisest man ever to have lived, made altars to foreign gods because of his wives. And here we have Israel coming back to their promised land, coming back to their temple to worship, and they're bringing foreign wives, people who refuse to abandon their old gods that, as we said, are not even real gods. Therefore, we can even say that these are people who listen to other religions, that... God ordained this divorce because, as it says in the New Testament, do not be unequally yoked. You can't be following other religions if God says, they're not of me. I don't condone this. They teach things I don't want taught. And we do see this today. I mentioned several ministries last week, and they are big culprits of this kind of thing. We see not only in the New Apostolic Reformation, in hyper-charismatic movements, but also in some mainline denominations, regular evangelical churches. All across the spectrum, we see people allowing New Age teachings, Eastern mysticism, to come in. Maybe many of you thought of the very same thing first. Oh, you mean like yoga. Now, I'm not going to say everybody who has a form of yoga in their church is teaching horrible Eastern mysticism. Some people do things like holy yoga. I, I think it's still dangerous because the whole point of yoga is to empty yourself and let something else come in. Or at the very least, be open to something else coming in, whether you want it or not. So it'd be better to do something like holy stretching or something like that. But it's also things like when you hear of people from Bethel, including Bill Johnson's wife, who's considered one of the leaders, doing stuff like grave soaking, taking an anointing from somebody who has come before by laying on their grave and just letting the anointing soak into their body. Or when you hear of ministries using essentially tarot cards. That's not good. And a lot of these new ministries are claiming, well, they're just reclaiming it for God. There, there are times you don't reclaim things. If it's stuff God has said, never do this, such as witchcraft. You don't do it. You're not reclaiming it. God said this is bad. And that's what God is calling out here. This is ancient Israel, yes. This is 2,400 years ago. But still, it's not good. And if you're following somebody who does these things, stop. It's not good. You could even say that God says, yeah, divorce from that. When is divorce good? When you have an unrepentant unbeliever in your midst. And if they're willing to go, as Paul says, let them go and you are good. If they refuse to repent and listen, that is when divorce is okay but it's still a very iffy question.
questionable thing. We can have another discussion about that sometime. Don't forget, you can leave comments. You can email it together at a simplemanofgod.com. Let's have that conversation. But in terms of this, verse 16 does point out not all divorce is good. If you're divorcing for your own personal reasons, that's not good. We may have heard before some of those arguments that ancient Jews were allowed to divorce because she burnt the meal. Gone. That's not good. If you're divorcing because you just don't feel it anymore, that's not good. But if you're talking about somebody who tries to draw you away from God, that's adultery. But maybe we should continue a little bit, because when we get into verse 13, God says, And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? And we could definitely say this is a lament. Oh, God, why won't you do what I ask you to do while I'm doing the things you tell me not to do? We've discussed before how people keep doing things God says not to do. And now, I think, again, recording this, it's now May 2020. This coronavirus pandemic is still happening. And as I pointed out last week, it helped prove a lot of these modern day apostles and prophets are obviously false. A, because they didn't see it coming. And B, they made lots of predictions and prophecies about what was going to happen that not only were wrong, but at times contradictory to what ended up happening. So we can definitely see they could be going, why aren't you doing anything? But now I'm going to go full-on figurative and analogous with this passage. Because God says, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit at their union? And what does this figuratively point to? What is this a shadow of? Obviously, Jesus Christ and his church. And when was his spirit given? Pentecost. Arguably, the beginning, temporally, of the church. And this was a time when humanity and God were finally joined together. We're in the early stages. We're not quite to the full marriage, but we are betrothed. We're not living together yet, but we're awaiting that time when we can finally come together as one in the great consummation at Christ's return. And yet we still see all of this problem where we have teachers divorcing from the true gospel and teaching things that ought not to be taught. That Our modern day priests, our pastors, our apostles, our prophets are bringing in foreign pagan wives and using it as a Christian teaching. They have abandoned that first love. And what does God say? Whether it's Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi, the Gospels, the book of Revelation, you have abandoned your first love. Repent, raise those godly children I desire. Or prove you are faithless in raising godless children. People who claim to be, be believers. But they have taken a false gospel. They have taken false teachings. And as Jesus said, you make them twice the children of hell you are. And I have lots of stories I could share about that. People I have met who follow people like Bill Johnson at Bethel Church. 
And whereas Bill tries to be more diplomatic in his teaching, these are people who are so far gone, I don't even know if they could be saved. But Jesus does say, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So there is still hope. So let us remember the warnings from Malachi from over 2,400 years ago. They still apply today. We still have people who are trying to bring in foreign pagan beliefs and twist truth. But God says, no, no, I am truth. In fact, Jesus' own words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you're not pursuing the real Jesus, the true God of the Bible, you're not pursuing God. And you are not a Christian. You must put your faith in the God of the Bible, in Jesus Christ, to be saved. And not follow these false teachings. And it's not going to get easier in the next section. So, next week when we get into chapter 2, verse 17, and into chapter 3. Well, let's just say, there's more heat coming. It's not so good. But let's continue the conversation. As I said just a few minutes ago, leave your comments on the blog, on the video. Send your emails to together at a simplemanofgod.com. Let's watch out for these false teachers. Let's pursue Jesus Christ, the true God of Scripture. I love you. Bye.